Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath and welcome back to the gymnasium, especially for you local community people. I feel like we're getting really good at this back and forth navigating and you show up where you're supposed to. Um, just one reminder at the end of the service, so I don't remind you then, it's still super helpful if some of you, after you've been dismissed from this place, stick around to help us put away the carpet and the chairs. There's a lot to do, and we thank you for every week that you help us with this. It's been really good. Today is the last of our emotional baggage series. We've been going over week after week different kinds of things, kind of negative emotions that we have and the baggage that we carry with us. I hope that it hasn't added to your baggage as we've talked about emotional baggage, but today is the last one. Next week, we get to talk about politics. Yes, aren't you excited? We will talk about politics and the church. Don't worry, I promise you it will be good, so please come back for that. We won't scare you away. I know you've heard a lot about politics lately. It'll be different from what you've been hearing about. So come back next week for politics and the church. But today is the last day where we are talking about emotional baggage, and we're going to be talking about depression. Which again, I'm feeling bad as I talk about all the negative emotions. I feel like we're just adding more layers on top of it. But I promise you, this is uplifting today. So before we jump into it, I want to jump into a story in the Bible, one that you know probably pretty well. Uh, but in order to go to the story that we're going to look at, we have to look at the story before the story. And the story before the story starts in 1 Kings chapter 18. It actually starts back before that in chapter 17 where we meet this prophet, the famous prophet Elijah. And apparently the context when he comes into the scene, Israel is kind of in a messed up place. Israel has kind of lost their focus about where they should be headed. Uh, their king is evil. They have kind of lost touch with God. They've adopted the local idolatry of the area and they're no longer following God. And so when Elijah comes into the scene, Elijah shows up to pronounce judgment. It's a real popular role, basically saying you guys are messed up, you're headed in the wrong direction, and because of that, judgment is coming your way, and this judgment is going to come through a severe drought that's going to last for years. And you have to remember when we're talking about a drought in biblical times, or not in our Western world where we live right now, that this is a severe consequence because their sustainability depends on the weather. They need the weather in order to have the food that they, that they sustain themselves on. And so without this, they are literally going to be dying. So he comes in and that's his first message. And he gives this idea that there is going to be a drought and that judgment has come to the land of Israel. And it doesn't make him very popular. He spends the next three years in hiding and he's just living by himself, and he lives with, by a widow, and he is hiding from the king, presumably because he would be destroyed for the message that he brought. He is not popular in this land. But eventually, we get to chapter 18, to the famous episode that we probably know most about him. That's in, in chapter 18, verse 20. He comes to Ahab, and he makes this proposal, and he asks him to gather everybody on to Mount Carmel. It says this in verse 20. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. And then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. I don't know what Elijah was expecting in this moment. I kind of half think, if you go back into his, his space, his mind space, I half think he thinks this is going to be a moment where he is drawing a line in the sand. He's making a bold declaration from, for God. Choose you this day who you're going to follow. And he expects that there's going to be some kind of response. Nothing. The people are silent. But rather than backing down, he digs in and he gets even more aggressive with perhaps his gutsiest plan. And he makes this plan that he's going to have a contest to see which God is real. Is it Baal or is it the Lord that he serves? 
And so he makes this contest where the prophets of Baal, which are 450 of them, by the way, and just him by himself, they're going to make a sacrifice for their God. He's going to make a sacrifice for his God. And whichever God sends down fire to consume it will be the true God. And the stakes are super high. Because you can imagine the one who loses will probably not live to see another day. This is a very gutsy move by Elijah. Verse 26, So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. But nothing. About noontime, Elijah gets sassy. That's not in this translation, but he gets sassy. He begins to mock them. You have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is God. Perhaps he is daydreaming. Perhaps he is relieving himself. Translate it, going to the bathroom, in case you missed it. Or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. He is trolling these guys. He is being relentless because he is so confident that his God is going to come through. Verse 38, it comes to the evening. They finally give up and it comes to him and he's about to make his sacrifice. Before the sacrifice is made, he asks them to dump water on it once, then twice, then three times, saturate it to make sure that there's no trickery happening. Verse 38, immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. That's always amused me, by the way, when it says this in this verse, as if that's the amazing part. It even licked up all the water in the trench. It says it burned up the stones. I think that's pretty crazy in itself. Verse 39, And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is is God. This is the famous scene. This is all setting up just for the story we're going to jump in, but this is the famous scene most of us know super well, the scene on Mount Carmel where he sees God act in a powerful way. And it seems like a very successful moment. Before, when he makes this call, the people are silent, but right now, the people can't deny that God is powerful, and they fall on their face in that moment. Declare him to be God. And I think for Elijah in this moment, what he's expecting is this is a turnaround moment. This is a watershed moment. This is going to change the trajectory of Israel. From this moment on, they will be following God again. But that's not what happens. Apparently, this is just sort of a moment where they're kind of moved by the, the fear of the situation. They fall on their faces, but nothing changes. There's not a groundswell where people are changing their minds about who they follow. In fact, the situation for Elijah gets worse. We go to the next chapter, chapter 19, verse 1. When Ahab got home, that's the king, he told Jezebel everything, and that's his wife, everything that Elijah had done, including the way that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. We skipped that part of the story. That didn't go over well either. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. And in verse 3, we see a shift in Elijah. He was afraid and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there which basically means at this moment he has a servant who's kind of like his understudy, and at this moment he sees his ministry, his professional role is being put on pause. Maybe it has ceased entirely. That's why he leaves his servant here. This isn't just someone who works for him like in his house. This is his understudy. But his professional role is undone, so he leaves his servant behind because he's afraid. And he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. And he says this, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Quite the transition for Elijah. Here we had Elijah literally having a mountaintop experience 
with one of, one of the more famous roles where God interacts with humanity in a miraculous way, and suddenly all of that is undone by the threat of Jezebel, and we find him, first of all, running afraid for his life, trying to escape the situations around him. Have you ever felt in your life like you wanted to just simply escape from something difficult? Here's what I'm hoping that you can pick up from this message today. I'm hoping that you can recognize that this person named Elijah was one of the most significant people in the Old Testament. When Jesus comes in later in the story, before Jesus comes, we're told that the spirit of Elijah is going to return because that was the most powerful prophet that they had in the Old Testament. And the spirit of Elijah will come ahead of Jesus' first coming here on earth. This was a significant person. And if Elijah experienced moments where things went down, if Elijah experienced moments where he was discouraged, I think you can give yourself permission for feeling a bit discouraged yourself, right? So have you ever had a moment in your life where you wanted to escape something hard? Because we have things that afflict us. Maybe you don't have a Jezebel in your life who's trying to kill you, but you have things that bring you down. You have things that discourage you. Like what is the mountaintop experience where you were at once over here and then you end up down here? Maybe for you, last month was a different month than this month because last month you were dating the person of your dreams but then they broke your heart. And suddenly here you were just four weeks ago and over here everything was like in vivid color. You could see clearly life was thrilling, but once that breakup happens, you find yourself over here. Or maybe it's not about relationships, maybe it's even about God. Maybe last year for you was a moving experience for the students here at GCA. Maybe here for you, you encountered God like you never had before and you felt like something was alive and breathing like you hadn't seen, but then suddenly you come to this year and it seems like God is silent. You were over here and the next thing you're down here. Maybe you found the job that you thought was your calling, you were making your way, you thought your life was on course and then you got laid off and suddenly your life is upended. We have things in life that happen that bring us discouragement. Life is like a roller coaster. Sometimes things are great, sometimes things are not so great, and sometimes we just want to escape. And the escape looks different. Sometimes the escape for us is simply putting up walls around us so that we don't have the relationships that we once had. So if you got hurt by someone, Maybe your form of escape is trying to prevent other people from getting too close to your life. Maybe your way of escape is like you experienced failure at some point in time. You tried something, you put yourself out there, and it didn't go so well, and so you stop trying. You stop putting yourself out there because it's easier if you just simply escape the challenge. Or maybe sometimes it's just simply staying in bed. Like you can barely get yourself out of bed in the morning because once you get yourself out of bed, you have to face the day ahead of you. We have different ways of escaping. We don't have to run to the desert, but we all have moments where things go down and we find ourselves wanting to escape. But he prayed, that he might die, which is ironic, by the way, when he prays that he might die, because he prays that he might die. Why is he afraid? He's afraid because Jezebel's trying to kill him. He runs away because Jezebel's trying to kill him, and when he runs away, what does he pray for? For his life to be taken away, because this is what discouragement looks like. Discouragement is often not very sensible. Like this, when we're in the dark clouds of discouragement, sometimes we're not the most practical people. Sometimes the decisions that we make don't actually make sense, but it's the real feeling, the reality of where we are. And Elijah, in this moment, prays for God to take his life. And sit on that for a second, because here in this moment, we see that Elijah has fallen into depression. Elijah, the prophet of God, who had just seen God act in his life in an incredible way, is actually suicidal, not wanting his life to continue. And at some level, I think that brings some kind of encouragement that we can find a fellow journey, person journeying through life 
with a similar experience to us. Because the chances are, in a room of this size, there are several of us, many of, more than several of us, quite a few of us who are struggling with feelings of depression right now. According to a Business Insider article from last year, over the last decade, we have seen the rates of depression climbing. Every age group, financial bracket, the circumstances across the country have been reported having worrying symptoms that are linked to depression, things like losing an interest in life, lacking the zest for learning new things, finding that the activi activities that you previously enjoyed, things that brought you joy, you now find meaningless. In fact, they found that today, on any given day, this is according to the World Health Organization, more than one in every 20 Americans are depressed. We struggle with depression. So again, when we're sitting here together, we come and we sing songs about Jesus, but some of us come with a heavy cloud. We have discouragement that we carry. And even more so when we talk about this particular group of people because we see it happening even more in young people. This is from sciencetimes.com. There is a current rise in mental health issues amongst the preteens and teenagers over the last decades, and studies show that this is because of the rise of social media. So in other words, what we see is we've seen more and more over the last decade that people in your peer group, talking to the high school students and even the before high school students, that we've seen a sharp incline of depression and other mental health issues over the last 10 years. Well, what has become more increasing over the last 10 years is social media. Let me throw up a graphic on the screen. If you look here, you can see this is only going up to year 2017, but this is part of the reason why they feel like it's tied to social media and not just simply the life that we live right now. Because if you look at the other age dem demographics, they're not increasing in the same way. If you look at the two lines going up top, the top one is 12 to 17-year-olds. The next one down is 18 to 25-year-olds. You can see a continually sharp climb of depression, discouragement, other mental health issues. And the, the feeling is, the, the understanding seems to be, that when we find ourselves spending increasing amounts of time on a screen, and if that time equals also a decrease of time of peer-to-peer -peer person, personal relationships, there will be more depression. Along with that, there will also often be less sleep which will cause more discouragement. And along with that, there will also be body image problems, where as you start comparing to different things that you're seeing online that you don't see in yourself, and that will also add to the cyclical factor of discouragement, as well as the fear of missing out. How many times have you ever jumped onto social media only to find out that this group of friends is out doing something that you didn't know about, and you suddenly start to wonder, why was I not invited? Why did I not get that invitation? And that adds to the discouragement, and they feel like that this is adding to the depression that we struggle with today. And this isn't even really what the talk is about. It's not really where we're headed right now, but I think that it's relevant to address the fact that sometimes there are things in our lives that might be adding to the problem. If you have discouragement, if you have some kind of depression that's lingering with you, maybe there are outside sources that you need to think about that might not be helping your situation. Because you have to ask yourself, who's being led by who when it comes to your interactions with your phone? Are you in control or is somebody else in control? Tristan Harris, who's now famous for the Social Dilemma documentary, he points out that for social media companies, their business model is to keep people engaged on the screen. And so they use your data to create models to predict your user behavior to maximize engagement time and advertising revenues. In other words, all of us have a dollar bill on our foreheads. And for the companies, their desire is to keep you engaged. And you just need to ask yourself, are you serving yourself well by the time and energy you put into different things? Is this good for my mental health? So when we're talking about mental health, what, are, what do we mean? What do we mean when we're talking about this word depression? Because I kind of feel like depression is one of those words that it's a bit amb ambiguous. It has some ambiguity to it, right? Like in some ways, we don't always know what we mean when we say it. It's sort of like love. Like I love my wife. 
I love coffee. But they're different, right? Like, you don't love in the same way. You might love Taco Bell, but I think you're crazy. Oh, I did. Oh, this is another food item. I'm so sorry. Some people love Taco Bell, and God bless them. But I have to question if you really know what love means if you're using it in that way. But of course, in the English language, love means all of these things. We use it to express true, sincere love as well as incredible like. But when it comes to depression, we kind of use it in a similar way where depression can mean different things. So I went to Psychology Today where they broke up depression to four different categories that I find super useful. One is situational. Depression can sometimes be situational. This is where it comes from some kind of incident, like a breakup, a rejection. Sometimes a quarantine can cause depression. And this is a near universal experience. All of us, at some point in time, will experience situational depression where something happens in your life and it impacts you. And it changes how you relate to the world around you and you will feel depressed. But then there's also biological depression. This comes from an imbalance of neurotransmitters or hormones, and this affects our mood and our physiology. In other words, it is a very physical thing. And when we have this kind of depression, it's different. This is usually when you would be taking a medication to help you get back on track into healthy directions. Then there's psychological depression. This is when you have unrealistic expectations, negative self-talk, a loss of perspective, and all of this will bring you, if it gets stuck into a rut, into a place where you have a sense of helplessness in life. And then finally, there's existential, which is the most interesting one to me, because this is often triggered by positive results. In other words, you get exactly what you were hoping to get. You've been aiming for this one thing, you want it to land this one position, and you got it, but it didn't bring you the satisfaction you thought it would. You want to make it on the team you've been trying every year, and finally, your last year, you make it on the team, but it doesn't deliver in the way that you think it would. And so after all the effort that you put into to get to this one place, you find that it fails, and then you feel depressed. All of this is to say, with all these different kinds of areas, that we're experiencing it differently, and that for some people, what might be a mild depression that you can just simply kick, kick the feeling out, you can do something and get over it. For others of us, this is a struggle that is going to be a lifelong companion, or at least a companion for years. And for others of us, there will be the need to have people who will come by our side to walk us through it. And it's not super helpful to be in a situational depression place and to get out of it, and then to think because you got out of that, that you can then inform someone else in another form of depression how they can act in the same kind of way. But the point is that all of us are touched by depression at some level at some time. But I don't know a lot about all of this. So I was thinking there's probably somebody here that knows more about mental health issues than me. Probably a lot of people that knows more than me. But there's one person in particular that I thought would be useful to come up. I'm going to invite you up front right now, and that is Althea. Oh, she's right behind me. I'm scanning in the audience, like, where does she go? Um, Althea, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are a, well, first of all, let's talk about who you're related to. I think it might already be on. So for those of you who don't know you, a lot of the students will know your husband. Who's your husband? Derek Collins. Okay, so you guys know Derek Collins? Yeah. Yes. Okay, a lot of you know Derek Collins. And tell us what you do. Well, what? I'm a school psychologist, and I work for County School. And you've been doing this for how long? Um, this is my 12th year here in Georgia, but I've also worked in California and Michigan. Okay, so you've had a lot of experience. And obviously, like, as I stammer through what I think are some things that I'm learning about mental health, you know a lot more. And so I thought it would be helpful if she would share some practical thoughts around depression and mental health, and I'm going to let you take over. All right. So when we're talking about depression, we're trying to get, you know, wanting to make the soccer team, practicing, practicing, and then just has no interest whatsoever. And, and it's an interest, loss of interest in many, many things. It's global, so it's very repressing. Um, another thing would be a loss of emotional control. Your friend seems very edgy. They're very irritable. They're triggered very easily. Um, and then often, too, you'll see depression walk hand in hand with anxiety. They're worrying about things, and it's illogical worries, things that 
don't make sense to you. Like, why are they so worried all the time? They're perseverating. They're on this kind of hamster wheel of worry, constantly worrying, and it's not productive, and it's keeping them awake. It's stressing you out when you're around them. Okay. Um, a sixth thing could be um, very pessimistic, negative thinking. Not everybody is an optimist. Not everybody wakes up ready to face the day. But it could be more than just being a realist or a pragmatic, pragmatic person. They're just very, very negative. And then the last is something Pastor David already mentioned is a sense of hopelessness. Say you're a senior and you've been talking to your friend about going to college, and then you see that there's just a decrease in any interest for the future. When you talk about it, it's not just about will I get in or what do I want to study, it's just, it's bleak. There's no interest there and it's very dark. So if you have a collection of these kinds of signs and you're like, what should I do? Should I talk to them? Talk to them. Rather than hold back, my advice to you is lean in and ask. And when I say lean in, the reason I say that verbiage is don't text them. Don't put it on the phone. You know, hey, how you doing? You're not going to kill yourself, are you? Make time to be face to face and talk to this person. Because there's nothing about, nothing about a text or a phone call that's going to be equal to face to face. You can see their expressions. You can see the tone, the volume of their voice, what their body language is, how they're responding to you. That's very important. Because you want to create a safe space when you talk to this person. Also, be ready to embrace the uncomfortable. Talking to somebody about the dark spots in their life or the darkness you've seen, it's not going to be happy. It's not going to be sunny. And you have to be prepared for the things they may share with you that make you uncomfortable and make you sad. But you just can't gloss over and say, oh, you'll be fine. Once you open that door, don't quickly shut it on them. Ask open-ended questions and be prepared to listen. So even if you're in person, put away your phone. Find a place to be personal, where you have time to sit and talk, where you can be intimate, not in the cafeteria, not where others are around, a safe place. Okay, once you've gotten to this point, and say your friend or even you personally are listening to me and you're like, oh, I really think this resonates with me, where do you go from here? Talk to a trusted adult. And I said adult because adults are resources. It can be an aunt, grandfather, you know, a teacher, a dean, a chaplain. These kinds of people are great resources to talk to because they can give you some guidance, give you some advice. But when depression is at a clinical level, when it is so serious that a person is really considering, do I want to be here in a month. I, I can't think about being on this planet in 2021. Because it's hit a clinical level, then you need to a, go to a clinical resource. And one of the things of the be that's beautiful about GCA is you have someone on campus who happens to be my husband. And he's a mental health therapist as your guidance counselor. And he is trained and skilled to assess the risk and what are the next steps? So, look for signs, create a safe space, and talk to somebody and accelerate it to the next level. I did hear something in the news about a week ago that I wanted to share. It's not happening right now. I mean, part of it did. And I believe it was a legislature that was just signed to create a national suicide hotline. If you go on the internet, you're going to find hotlines Nobody can remember those, you know, 10 digits. But everybody can remember 911 because it's a national number. So legislature, legislature has put into place by 2022 988, which is going to be a national suicide hotline. So two years, you're like, oh. but maybe in two years you might be in college or you might be working on a job, or you might still be here at GCA. And those three numbers can make a really big difference for you or for somebody else, because there will be people on that hotline who can help you with that clinical assessment. 
So that's my recommendation. Th thank you, Althea. Is that helpful? Go over those three things one more time, the three steps that you said. Signs. Looking for signs, creating a safe space to talk, and then getting a clinical assessment. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. I You're appreciate welcome. it. One of the things that I appreciate about that is it's so practical. And I, I hope, if nothing else, one of the things that you take from today is that if you are struggling with depression, if this is something that is a real struggle for you, this isn't something that you have to be ashamed of. That's not something that you have to hide. You don't have to feel like you're a broken person or that something's wrong with you. It's a very human experience. And we see it happening way back here in the Old Testament with Elijah. So what happens with the rest of the story? The rest of the story picks up in verse 5 of 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate, he drank, and he lay down again. It's one of my favorite verses because God chooses to nurture Elijah in one of my favorite ways of being nurtured eating and sleeping. But this is significant to me. Like the first thing that happens in this interaction with Elijah, Elijah is discouraged. He runs out to the desert. He cries out to God for him to take his life. And what's God's response to him? It's not one of condemnation. It's not one where he's saying, what's wrong with you? Haven't you seen the way I work in your life? Why are you discouraged? Just pull yourself back together. Instead, he feeds him and lets him take a nap. And then he feeds him again and lets him take a nap again. He takes care of him in a very practical way. And I think this is significant, first of all, to recognize that sometimes one of the answers that we need for our lives are just simple, practical, physical responses. Meaning that sometimes what you need actually is just simply some more sleep. I feel like sometimes in church we tend to overly spiritualize things and say, well, what you really need to do is pray harder. But the first thing that God says to Elijah is not simply to pray. The spiritual part comes later. The first thing you need is food and a nap. I think this also speaks to taking practical steps when we have professionals recommending things to us. When a professional says, I think some medication would help you. I think you need a physical intervention here that will help you move in the right direction. I think it makes sense to what God does is that he meets us with our physical needs first in order to take us farther in our journey. He feeds him, he cares for him, and he lets him take a nap. But he's building him up for something more. He's building him up for a journey where he's going to take a long journey further into the desert. Verse 8, so he got up, he ate, and he drank the food they gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount, depending on your version, either Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. But it's Mount Sinai. If it's talking about Mount Horeb, it's the same place, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Notice the first thing that Elijah does here. After God's nourished him, he's had his energy, and he has a God encounter. The first thing he does is he defends himself. I have been zealous for you, God. This is what I have done. I've put my work into this, but nothing has come out the way I expected it to. I thought that my energy investing into this situation would have a different result, and why has it not worked? And in a sense, you almost feel like Elijah's blaming God in this, saying, why haven't you taken what I've invested into the situation and made it better? And it seems like what Elijah is really struggling with here is he's He's kind of adopted a, a religion mentality to his relationship with God. And what I mean by that is that religion tends to be a thing where we put an equation on God, where we expect that if we do this kind of situation, or if we do the right kind of work, we will expect God to, to work back towards us what we invested into it. 
And so we expect almost like a vending machine. If we do this, God will do that in return. If we show up to church every Sabbath, if we pay our tithes like we should, if we, should, if we treat people the way that we should treat people, then God's going to bless my life. At the very least, God's going to rescue my life at the end of times. And it becomes this religion rather than a relationship with God. And it's funny because God doesn't even really address this. He doesn't really address the issue that Elijah's obviously concerned about because he says the exact same thing twice, but God ignores it. Instead, all God does is he shows himself to Elijah. And this is where things get particularly interesting. Verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there. The Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. And it was a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And, the wind, and, and after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out, and he stood at the entrance of the cave. What does this mean? Is God making some kind of statement against the the ruckus of the loud noises. I think I've even heard it before that this is a testament to the kind of music that we should listen to because God doesn't like the really loud music. He wants something soft, something quiet. But that's not what this is about because there's other places within the Bible where you find God showing up in these exact same forms. In fact, the author here, the original author, is being very careful to help you think back to another story. The Bible does this all the time in the Old Testament, where, well, both Testaments, actually, where you're reading one thing and there's all these signals pointing you back to another story that you're supposed to be thinking about while you read this story. And in this case, the story you're supposed to be thinking about is the story of Moses when he goes to Mount Sinai. When he has a 40-day experience where he is without food and water, where he has a theophany, a theophany, a revelation of God, where God shows himself. Where just like Elijah is tucked away in the cleft or in the cave, Moses is tucked away in the cleft or the cave, and God passes before him. But for Moses, the situation is very different. This is when the Ten Commandments are given, and we find this in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. This is in a bit of a different order than what Elijah experiences it. But when the people see God in this story, in verse 18, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. They have the exact opposite kind of God revelation in this moment, where they see something dramatic, where they see or they hear the thunder, they feel the ground shake, they see the smoke, and God is there. In all of that, that's who God is. And in fact, there's a really clear connection in the, in the original language here, where when it says the still, small voice, the word for voice is actually the same exact word that's used over here for thunder. Sometimes it means voice, sometimes it means thunder. And in the context, you have to decide which one it is. But here in this situation, it's paired with this idea of a still, small voice, the opposite of the thunder that the Israelites heard earlier. In other words, God is saying, the ways that you expect me to show up in your life, the way you expect me to interact with your life is totally, completely unpredictable. Elijah, you probably think you're coming in for one kind of experience. You make this journey that's parallel, that's mirroring the journey of Moses himself. You expect to have a God encounter. You get a God encounter, but it looks nothing like what you expected because the way I come into your life never looks the same. The way I come into your life is going to be out of your expectation. You thought that by being the kind of person that was being zealous for the cause of me was going to bring you a path that looked one way. It looks totally different than that because the path of following God is not clear. Well, it's not clear in the sense of it's not predictable. You don't know where I'm leading. But more than that, when commentators look at this, when scholars look at this, they think that the idea that God's giving to Elijah is a still, small voice that speaks directly to the individual. That the God that the Israelites saw earlier, the God of the thunder, the God of the smoke, the God of the earthquake, was a God that was there, that was speaking to the entire Israel nation. But here, the still, small voice comes directly to one individual and speaks in a very personal, conversational, 
way to him. And it's after he, gives, he speaks to him in this still small voice that he, he redeems him for all of his brokenness. All of his fears, he, he kind of washes aside. All of the hesitations of engaging in life, this desire to escape life, God gives him a new calling and says, I still have a purpose for you. I still have need for you to interact in my world because I have a calling that you have not yet fulfilled. And this calling was going to continue to pass the torch from person to person as other people carried out the work. Elijah thought he was all alone. He wasn't all alone. But God still had a use for him. I think what we see happening in the story of Elijah is we see the gospel coming alive. Timothy Keller says this about the gospel. He says, if we're looking for the definition of the gospel, it's this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. For all of our brokenness, for all of the things that make us feel like maybe we don't have enough to continue going in this life, for all the things that make us think maybe we don't have enough to give, maybe we don't have the competency that we thought we had, maybe we don't have the, the strong spirituality that we wanted to have, maybe we don't have the strong relationships that we wanted to have. But for all of our brokenness, God still sees us as more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. Let's pray. God, thank you that you don't leave us alone. That wherever we are, whatever situation we're in, whether we're in the high of life right now or the lows, the valleys, you are still there beside us. And you see something in us that we don't see in ourselves. May we continue to trust in your love and grace. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a happy Sabbath.